welcome everybody to the class this morning and to be able to share uh, many special simchas uh, from amongst our classmates. Uh, Dini Lapkowski became a grandmother for the first time. Her children, Moishi and Mushka Tauber, had a baby and we welcome her to the best club in the world. Yehudis Edelman became a grandmother again. Um, her children, Chaya and Bera Evers from Amsterdam, had a baby girl named Rivka Panina after her mother. Orit Rutsky um, celebrated two simchas, the bar mitzvah of her grandson, Ezi Rutsky, and she too became a grandmother once again. Um, Mendel and Strani Rutsky had a baby boy. Um, so Mazel Tov, and uh, we daven for only simchas for everybody, and simchas with Chelech HaHertzer. At the same time, um, there is a young boy who is struggling mightily for his life, and we are dedicating our learning this morning for a full shalema Reva, a full shalema Nisis, a full shalema Lemaila Midera Chateva for Menachem Mendel Ben Hamadina. Um, we welcome Chana Perlman back. We missed you in person, and we are holding all of the all of the IDF inclusive of the children, the grandchildren, and the relatives of everybody in this class. We're all one family, that's for sure. And um, that David should, should watch over them, bring the hostages home, have Rahmanis on us all, and uh should be shalom. Mashiach should come. Um, our our Sikha today really just mentions um a story and then goes into an exploration of the idea of Nesius, of leadership, of Malchus, of uh, Moshe Yeshua, and how it compares to later um, leaders amongst our people. And um, one can argue that the question of succession, the question of having to give over one's position, leadership, um, to the next generation is one that is always fraught with deep emotion. And it's it's always, even under the best circumstances, a very poignant and, and difficult thing. And this is what is dealt with here. So if you have a Chumish or a Chayenu or Dvar Malchus uh, handy, you might want to look at the Psukim um, that create the the basis for, for this morning's Sicha. Uh, so we are in Perak Havzayin, Pasuk Tezvav, Vaidaber Moshe Hashem Leimar, Moshe spoke, Tashem, and said, Yifkoid Hashem Alekei Harucha is Lechol Basar Ish Ala Eda. Please, Hashem, the God of all people's characters, appoint a man over the community. So Moshe realizes that he is um, taking his leave and he's asking Hashem to appoint someone over his flock. And Moshe says that this person should be a person, who will go out, and it's understood that it'll be to battle in front of them, and will return in front of them. And who will lead them out safely and bring them in safely. And Hashem's congregation should not be like sheep that do not have a shepherd. I think that on the heels of Gimel Tamos, these, these words hit us very, very deeply and very strongly, these very, very uh, heartfelt, poignant words. So Hashem said to Moshe, Kach l'chaz Yeshua ben Nun, Ish asher ruach bai, Take Yeshua ben Nun, a man in the Chayinu's uh, rendition who has a considerate character, v'samachta es yotcha olav, and you shall rest your hand upon him. V'ha'amadita oisei lefnei Elazar ha'kayin, and you shall have him stand before Elazar the kayin, lefnei kol ha'eda, and before the entire congregation, the whole community, v'tzivisa yisei le'nehem, and you should direct him in full view of the entire community. In other words, this is not going to happen in the shadows. This is not going to happen in the middle of the night in the darkness. Hashem wants the 
uh, the succession to be made public, for the authority to be vested in full view of all of B'nai Yisrael, then asata olav, and you shall place some of your majesty upon him, leman yishmu kaladas B'nai Yisrael, so that all of B'nai Yisrael will listen to him. V'lefnei Elazar ha'koyin ya'amoyit, he will stand before Elazar the, the Kayin, v'sha'al lo'i b'mishpat ha'urim lefnei Hashem, and will inquire of him the ruling of the Urim before Hashem, Alpiv Yetsu, Val Piv Yavoyu, and according to Allah's instructions, they will go out to battle, and according to his instructions, they will return. Who? Mini Yeshua, Vachol Bene Yisrael, Itai Vachola Eda. And all of Bene Yisrael, and all of the Eda, and who is the Eda? Rashi says that's the Sanhedrin. Vayas Moshe, Kasher Tziva Hashem Isai, and Moshe did as Hashem commanded him to do. Vayikach Hasti Yeshua, he took Yeshua v'yamidehu l'fnei Elazar ha'kain v'fnei kol ha'edah. He put him before Elazar and the entire congregation. V'yismach es yadav, note that Hashem had said that he should rest his hand, but Moshe rested his hands. Rashi says, v'ayin yafa, he did it in a generous way. Yoyser v'yoyser mimashen etztava, shakadosh baruch hu amar loi v'samachta es yadcha, much more than he had been told to do. Hashem told him to put one hand. He put both of his hands. And in doing so, He thus made Yeshua into a full and overflowing vessel, and he filled him generously with his wisdom. That is uh, the narrative that supports the Sikha of today, which is a exploration of the type of leadership that Moshe and Yeshua um, held and how it compares and contrasts to later models of leadership in B'nai Yisrael. Pinchas Beis. Aleph. Sif Aleph, Beparsha Senu, Mesupar Aldvar, Bakoshas Moshe Mekadash Baruch, Yivka Hashem Goimer Isha Laeda. In our Parsha, we learn about Moshe asking of Hashem to appoint a leader upon B'nai Yisrael, Omana Kadash Baruch, and Hashem's response, Kachlachas Yeshua Ben Nun, Visamachta Es Yadcha Alav, Vasher Chain Asa Moshe, Vayismachas Yadav Alav, and that is what we just read that Hashem told Moshe to take Yeshua ben Nun and to put his hand on him. And this is the original smicha. Um, and Moshe put his hands on him. Regarding the appointment of a Jewish king, Kasav HaRambam, the Rambam wrote, Ein ma'amidin melech betchila, ela alpi beizdin shal shivim zakenim ve'alpi navi. A king can never be appointed, you know, from from the from the get go, from the start, without a basin of seventy zakenim and a navi. And then the Rambam goes on to say, "Ki Yehoshua, like Yehoshua, sheminayu Moshe Rabbeinu basedinay, like Yeshua who was appointed through Moshe and his basin." And from this, it's it's proven shaladas Rambam. So it's clear that from Rambam's perspective, the appointment of Yeshua, about which we just read, was the Indian, was the concept of appointing a king. We have to understand. The Rambam in his work Paskins, that when you appoint a king, you have to anoint him with the Shemin HaMishcha, with a special anointing oil. We don't find in the narrative that Moshe Rabbeinu appointed Yeshua by anointing him with the Shemin HaMishcha. In brackets, and we don't find that that Moshe was a, was anointed. Although the Rambam paskins, he adjudicates about Moshe that Moshe held the position of a king. 
But we have an easy answer. But Moshe became the leader before these details about how a king is is uh, installed or is inaugurated or his sovereignty begins. He he became uh, the leader before all of this was um, commanded by Hashem. So that's a that is something that we can put aside that Moshe was not anointed. But why wasn't Yeshua anointed? Base, see if base. The chayra haya efshal yashiv zayis al pipsak acher shel haramba. Seemingly, we can reconcile this by referencing a different psak from the Rambam. The Rambam writes, "Ein moishchen mimenu mishemana mishcha ledayres." We don't anoint with the special anointing oil in every generation. Ella, and he lists who is anointed. He lists the Kayin Gadol. He lists the 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 um the priest the the the, the Kayin that will lead Bnei Yisrael out to war. And he concludes with Umalche Beis David and the kings of Beis David. And the Chayvon Sheishu Aloi Hayem Umalche Beis David the Chayin Loi Nimshach B'Shem Mishcha. So because Yeshua was not from Malchi Beis David, so uh, that's why he wasn't anointed with the Shem and Mishnah. But as the Rebbe so often does after he sets forth a possible answer, he says, but in truth, it's the opposite. The fi shita sarambam ain't zet tirus. If you go according to the Rambam's trajectory of thought, if you if you study the Rambam, if you go according to his shita, according to his way of understanding, then this doesn't this doesn't help us. Because as a source for the din that when you install a king, you anoint him with anointing oil, what does the Rambam bring as a proof text? He brings the Pasuk, that Shmuel Hanavi took the um, container with the anointing oil and he poured it over his head, and he kissed him. And who are we talking about? Hamadaber b'mshich ha'shol. We're talking about Shmuel anointing and installing Shol HaMelech. And Shol, Shalai Hayami Malchai based of it. And Shol was decidedly not from the Davidic ancestry. O Mikan, Shaladas HaRambam, Nimshach Shol, B'Shev Mishcha. So from here we see that according to the Rambam's opinion, Shaul was anointed with Hashem and HaMishcha. Mukhach. So from this, it, 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 we must say, Shekavonas HaRambam b'masha kosov k'shem ha'midin ha'melech moishchen yose b'shem and HaMishcha that when the Rambam writes that when a king is installed, he is anointed with the anointing oil, he l'chol melech, af b'yilu shaloi b'malchei based of it. That this applies to every king, not only the kings of based of it. And from the very verbiage that, that the Rambam uses, he doesn't qualify the word melech. He simply says, which leaves it wide open to a melech of any and all ancestry. On the other hand, and and the fact that the Rambam also writes that for all generations the anointing all the anointing oil would be used for very specific circumstances that would include the kings of base David. Note that the word laachare is underscored. It's only after Shekvar Nimshach David. Once David was anointed, then for all generations following that the kings of Davidic ancestry were anointed in like manner. And, and they were, they, they merited to have the crown of sovereignty. And this was for David and for his male children forever.
So now our question is right back in its full strength to where we started. So then, question right back where we started, why was Yeshua not anointed? Clearly, according to the sheet of the Rambam, he is a king. Why was he not anointed? B'Shem and Mishcha. K'Shem Shanim Shach Shol, L'Das Rambam. Just like Shol was anointed later, also not from Beis David. Si'if Gimel. V'Yuvan, and we'll understand this, B'Hektem, by prefacing, and this is most often the way the Rebbe explains things. First, he gives us background material. He asks us to zoom out and to look at the larger picture. And he says, we can only understand this by prefacing Habir B'divri HaMedrash, the explanation on the words of the Medrash that the Medrash gives, Al Divri Meshe Rabbeinu Yifkait Hashem Goimer. The Medrash uh, analyzes what what did Moshe hope for when he said to Hashem, please appoint a leader over B'nai Yisrael? And the Medrash says, She Moshe Rabbeinu hayasavor she yirshu banai eskvedi gdulasi. That Moshe Rabbeinu believed, hoped, postulated that his children would inherit his honor, his greatness. And in response to this, Hashem said to him, The one who plants the figs will eat its fruit. Your children sat maybe on the sidelines, possibly, is the way to understand this, and they did not engage in Torah. Yeshua, hayil v'hu sh'arscha b'chol k'echei k'day hu she'yishamesh es Yisrael. Yeshua, on the other hand, served you with all of his strength. We know le'yamesh Yeshua min ha'el, Yeshua did not move from Meshach's tent, and therefore he is worthy to serve B'nai Yisrael in this capacity as leader. Seemingly, it's not understood. If Meshach Rabbeinu's sons did not engage in the study of Torah, not to the extent that Yeshua did, certainly, So how is it possible that Moshe, to begin with, should even entertain such a notion. In other words, if they are so categorically not deserving, so is Moshe so obtuse, Moshe so blind to the reality, what was Moshe thinking that my children should, should take over if, if they're not qualified? So the Chepa says, Simply, we can advance the this the following possibility to explain this. Shekavanas Moshe bevar kashosoi yifka Hashem goyme ish ala ida haisaloi le ish sheyilami tarim bnei Yisrael el arak ki meforish bevar kashosoi lamelach. Moshe was not asking that his children should be the ones to teach Torah, but as he very clearly articulated in his request that they should become. A king, Asher Yetze Lifnehem, Vasher Yavoy Lifnehem, La Melchama. Moshe was hoping that they would take over the reins of his sovereignty in regard to leading the Jews to war. After all, they're poised at their entrance into Eretz Yisrael, finally, and everybody understands that there's going to be wars to be fought. So Moshe is asking that his children should gain that capacity. So because in his mind, he, he what he had in mind was that his children should be Yerushim, 
in terms of their taking the Jews out to war. And Malchus is generally um, passed down be Yerusha. So therefore, it wasn't a stira. There was no uh, contradiction here in his fully understanding that his children were not as immersed in Limar HaTayra as Yeshua was, and at the same time asking for them to take over his position in terms of leading B'nai Yisrael out to war. But the Rebbe says, <laughs> this is not, this can't be the answer. Why? Because Sha'al Pizeh, if, if this is the open and shut understanding of this, then we don't understand what Hashem is answering to Moshe. That Neitzer Te'ena Yechel Piria. Banecha Yashvu Lehevli Asku But Hashem is not, uh, that can't be really what Moshe is thinking based on Hashem's response. And Hashem is Baichin Kleis. Hashem surely understands what, what Moshe is asking for. And Hashem answers, nope. They didn't make the investment. They cannot reap the harvest. They were not the ones that planted the figs. They're not going to be able to eat the fruit. But we're not even talking about Tyre here. Mesh is talking about he wants his sons to be the kings that take the Jews out to war. And Hashem is answering him that it's all about that they were not a second Tyre to the extent that Yeshua was. But who mentioned Torah? If we're going according to the understanding that Moshe wasn't looking for his children to take over in the Limit HaTorah or the teaching of Torah department, but simply to be the king. So the Chabbat says that can't be the resolution here. Because if the Ebesh is answering him about Torah, then Moshe's request must have been rooted in their taking over in a way that necessitates their being invested in Torah. Dalit. The Megala um, a, a safer based on the on the uh, Arizal's Torah, written by Rabbi Nassan Nata Shapiro, lived in the 16th century. Bier as Kefal Aloshim Bepasuk, the Megala Mukais, explains the seeming alliteration, the doubling of verbiage in the Pasuk, where Moshe says, Asha Yetzi Lefneim, Asha Yavai Lefneim, Veshuv, and then again says, Vasha Yetziim, Vasha Yevim, basically repeating the same request that this leader should take B'nai Israel out to war and bring them back. And then says it again. Shabikesh Moshe. So the Megala Mukais explains that what Moshe was looking for was Shayu Shnei Bnei Adam Hamanhikim. The model that he had in mind was actually binary. He was looking for two leaders to take over after him. Dahainu meaning Ish Echad Ala Eda Shayetzi Lefneim Bimilchama Chule. One leader will be the leader that takes them out to war. And one leader will take them out, will lead them in terms of Torah. And so on this request of his putting forth a model of two leaders who would in tandem lead B'nai Yisrael, Hashem replied, She'echad yinaheg oisam, that only one will lead them. Yeshua will be the person. She'yia melech ve'ov based in Shal Yisrael ve'chacham shalahem b'tayr. Yeshua is going to be their king. He's going to be the av based in. He's going to be the, the head of the based in. And he is going to be the... Um, the 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 chacham that that teaches them Torah, lefi shei efshar lebeis melachim sheishtam shu bekeser echot, because 
two kings can't use one crown. This is an expression from the Gemara that we are familiar with from that very famous Rashi, uh, based on which there is so much Kabbalah about the whole idea of womanhood, etc., right? Because it's the idea of the diminishment of the moon, the Mir Talavana, etc., etc. And yes, Chani, the Rebbe is going to address what would happen in other generations, just about to go there. But here, the Megala Mukas is saying that Nebuchadnezzar said, no, that can't be. You can't have two kings who are vying over one crown. Because you have one spokesperson, you have one leader for a generation, and not two. The Alpizeh, and based on this explanation, now we can better understand the Medrash that the Rebbe brought down. Because Moshe had in mind a, mod a model where there were two leaders, one would be the king and one would be the leader in terms of Torah and based him. So if there's going to be two leaders, then in Moshe Rabbeinu's mind, it wasn't a steer. There's no contradiction between his sons not being as invested or as steeped or as anchored in the Torah as Yeshua is, because one of them could be the king and Yeshua will be the leader in Torah. But the Ebishter's will was that they should have one leader. The who ye hain hamelach, the hain of basin shall Yisrael. And this one leader would be both the king and the of basin. And because for somebody to be the leader of Torah, they have to be um, deserving, they have to be appropriate for that, for that position. They have to be Neitzer to Eina. They have to be the one that uh, worked to plant the figs, and only then Yechel Piria can they be the one that eats. Uvan of Shel Meishalei Hayu Matim Lekach, and and Meishal Rabbeinu's sons were not uh, fit for this position. Lekach Lefishalei Asku B'Tayr, because they were not as involved in Tayr. Lehayu B'Koyachem Klal L'Reshes uh, Kvedi Shel Meishe, and therefore they were not in a position to be ears to Moshe's position and to Moshe's glory and honor. V'davke Yeshua, shahaya masur v'nasu l'tayah. And it was specifically Yeshua who was devoted and completely um, given over to Torah. L'ayrak l'limur ha-tayah kim gam l'shimusha shal tayah. Not only in terms of the... Uh, academic knowledge of Torah, but also steeped in the practicum. He had shimush with Moshe Rabbeinu. He, he didn't move from Moshe Rabbeinu's ayhel. He, he, he had watched for years how Moshe Rabbeinu taught and adjudicated uh, and, and, and helped people with problems. And he had shimush. He had, he had experience. He had done, uh, let's say, an internship, an externship, and whatever other terms you want to call it with Moshe Rabbeinu, so he had the capacity to um, be the Mimali Makain, to take over the place, to succeed Moshe Rabbeinu. See if hey. Avo, however, I'll be perish Hamagala Mukais. Sarik Lahavin, Mawa Tamshali Kibel Hakadish Borho, as far as Moshe Jush Nebene Adam Hamanikim. But now that we understand what Moshe was thinking and Hashem's rebuttal and Hashem's lack of embrace of that model, so now we're asking, like Hani asked, why not? We know that later in history that would decidedly be in the model. So why did the Ebishter not accept it at this point? Dilachaya, seemingly, yeah, it's true that two kings 
can't be vying and jostling for one crown. But that's when there's one crown. And more. We find in the subsequent generations that that's exactly the model that was employed. One person was the king and one person was the of Beisdin. The Rambam describes this as the one who was greatest in Torah knowledge. He was greater than all of the members of the Sanhedrin. And they all um, kind of unanimously placed him as their head. And he is the one that the Chachamim referred to as the Nasi. And he, his position was under Maisha Rabbeinu. So he reported, as it were, to the Maisha. Umilvadai, and then separately, and besides this leadership, was the Melech. Asha Yitzim, who would take them out to war, bring them home from war safely, etc. Sha'asag benihol tzorchei am kule. And this person, in addition to taking them out to war, um, was busy with, with, with taking care of their needs. And on the contrary, in the later generations, when there was this binary model of leadership, it was so divided, the lanes were so separate, that we have a halacha, that the melech can't sit in the Sanhedrin. So, since there is such a model, there would be such a model, but here the Abishta did not embrace this model for Yahishua. We're forced to say that, that this is exactly the, the root of it. Because yes, Torah and Malchus are two different types of leadership. Hari ein so when you have this binary model, it's not a contradiction to the rule that you have one spokesperson for every generation. But but obviously, that's not what the Ebershter wanted here. So we're back to our original question. So why, in fact, was this model not embraced, not employed at this moment in history? Why not? See if vav. And now the Rebbe advances his explanation, always qualifying with one might say. In the Rambam's preface to his Mishnah Torah, Kasav HaRambam, Eseder HaMesur B'Ter SheBa'alpeh, MiMoshe Ba'ad Rav Ashi. The Rambam delineates the chain of transmission of the Torah Shabal Peh, beginning with Maisha until Rav Ashi at the sealing of the Talmud Babli. Ubeminion Mekable HaTorah. And when he delineates each chain in the transmission, in the receiving of the Torah from the generation that preceded them, D.A. Karambam Bilshoinoi, the Rambam, is very specific with his verbiage, the kasav, and he writes, pleni kibel me pleni. X received from Y. But when he says who they received from, he says, hamakabel hakoidem, the, the, the one that received previously, Y, u beiz dinoi, meaning, o oi it's either it was received 
from this and this person and is based in, or this and this person and his friends, his cohort. And in another place, he explains, Shebekach bikesh lahadgish, shahakabola rabim mi rabim lo yochid mi yochid. With this, the Rabbam wants to underscore that the chain of transmission was from a plurality of people to another plurality of people. It wasn't one person to one person. Why is this so important? Because if you're dealing with one individual, it's always possible for there to be a breakdown in communication. But if you're dealing with a large group, and a large group is transmitting something to another large group, then presumably if there are any areas of contention or lack of understanding and clarity, it has to be worked out at that moment of transmission. And therefore the Rambam underscores that this was the way it happened. Amnam, however, matzinu But in this paradigm, we find an exception. B'negei Yeshua. When it comes to Yeshua's listing, Shina HaRambam, the Rambam changes his, his Lashon, his terminology, Vidiek Laimar, Uskenim Rabim Kiblu Mi Yeshua. Many Zekenim received the transmission from Yeshua. Leloi HaHesafa Ubeist in Kiyetzepazeh without qualifying that it was from Yeshua and his based in, or Yeshua and some other cohort or some other group. It's simply Yeshua. Vitam hachiluk. And the reason for this distinction, for this digression from the way the Rambam records the transmission in the other generations, move on, midivri haramam sham lefneza. And the reason for this difference is understood from what the Rambam writes before this. He writes, Ter Shabal Peh, Limda Meish Rabbeinu Kula, Beveiz Dinoi, L'shivim Zekeinu. Meish Rabbeinu taught the entirety of the Ter Shabal Peh that he imparted in his based in to Shivim Zekeinu. Ve'elazar Upinchas Yeshua, Shloshdan Kiblu Mimesha. And Elazar, his son, and Pinchas, his son, and Yeshua, those three it received it from Mesha Rabbeinu. Uli Yeshua, and separately he taught it to Yeshua, Shehu Talmidei Shal Mesha Rabbeinu, who was the student, the the main student, the protege of Moshe Rabbeinu, to Yeshua, Masar Torah Sheba Alpeh V'tzivahu Aleha. So, to the other people, it was a plurality, and they received it from Moshe. But to Yeshua, Moshe himself, not Moshe Ubeis Dinoi, Moshe himself, transmitted the Torah Shabbat Alpeh and he commanded him concerning it. Kilaymar, this is to say. Yeshua lehoya rak mekabel mi Moshe Rabbeinu ke Elazar Pinchas v'shivim z'kenim. Yeshua was not merely a recipient of the transmission from Moshe as were Elazar and Pinchas and the 70s kenim. Ela Yeshua dafka Masar Moshe Teresh about Pet Kula. But to Yeshua, Moshe transmitted in a completely different way the whole corpus of this knowledge of Teresh about Pet. And I just for a moment want to just quickly say that um, one of the things that the Rambam explains in his Hakdama is that there are different aspects of the Torah Sheba Alpeh, that there are different strata. Here we're talking about the largest percentage of the corpus of Torah Sheba Alpeh that Moshe Rabbeinu taught when he gave B'nai Yisrael the Torah. And all of this 
he transmitted to Yeshua in a different way than to the others that he taught. And like the famous Mishnah that the whole Pirkei of us opens with, Moshe kibel Torah misinai umesarli Yeshua. Moshe received the Torah from Hasinai and gave it over. I'm I'm struggling here, and if somebody could help me, I'm struggling to find um, an English word that can encapsulate the what the Rebbe is saying here that u. The idea of umisara li Yeshua, it's not simply teaching, it's not even simply transmitting, it's maybe inheritance, inheritance. A word of an inheritance. Maybe. I don't know if umisara is inheritance. That would be more Yerusha. Um it, it, it's like the transposing of the the like um somebody said Nahami saying maybe infused maybe I I I I, I, I don't know like imprinted because it's absorbed by the other side. I don't know. Maybe but I, I'm I still think that's not completely um capturing it because all of uh transferring yeah thank you Jane Maybe maybe that's that's the word that we're looking for transference like because all the the words um, besides Yerusha which which is a different Indian and I see why Rachi is saying that because Yerusha flows without anything that the person that gets it does on their part so I think there's something to that even though the word Umisara is not you know about Yerusha. But 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 thank you, Rachi, because that allows us to maybe hone in on the distinction here. Because when you teach other people, a lot depends on their being able to receive it. And here it seems like the Rebbe is explaining that it was simply taken and transferred in in total to Yeshua. Thank you, everybody. Um and that's why the Rambam does it right about Yeshua, that Yeshua gave it to the Skenim with his basin. Because Yeshua transferred it himself to the to the Skenim. So now what the Rabbah has done is underscore for us that there was a singular unparalleled type of transference or transposition that occurred in those first two generations um hold on i see there's a message in the chat room but it does seem like yeshua had to be the fitting recipient unlike the inheritance yeah in that way the the parallel breaks down honey that's correct in that way, the parallel breaks down. Because a Yerush doesn't have to love the one that they're marriage from. They don't have to know them. They don't have to be cognizant of them, etc. And Yeshua had to earn this, yes. And so now we have established that there is a profound difference between Moshe, Yeshua, and those who would take over a parallel position in the subsequent generations. Yeshua and Moshe Rabbeinu shavim b'kach. Yeshua and Moshe are equal in the respect she misayrus had teresh about pek kula, nitna l'chol echad mehem, the nimsara mimenu levadai. Their unique standing is that the entirety of the teresh about pek was transferred to them, and they themselves, without any backup choir, as it were, transferred it to the next generation. 
מה שאין כן, a contradistinction, מה שנשיא הסנהדרין אמי תכלס מישר בינו כנל, but when it comes to the subsequent generations, and we talk about the נשיא, the prince, the president, the head of the Sanhedrin who stood under מישר, הרי זה בנגיע לפרט מסוים. So we understand that that status um, bespeaks one dimension of who they were. Just like Moshe was above the Shivim Zakenim in his day, so vis a vis the Sanhedrin and subsequent generations, the Nasi of the Sanhedrin would be Al Gabehen, would be above them. But when it comes to to transfer to transferring the Torah ain who I may tachas my shabenu ela ha Torah nim seres beemtsos kol ha based in rabim mi rabim. But any subsequent leader of the based in was not a placeholder for my shabenu. Did not hold the same authority. Did not occupy the same position because in subsequent generations. It was always transmitted Rabim me Rabim. Seif Zayin. Bizehu hakiluk bein zmanu shal Moshe b'Yeshua l'dayu shal acharehim. And this is the difference between Moshe and Yeshua and the subsequent generations. Because in subsequent generations, shebehem hamelech vav beis and shal Yisrael hayu shnei manhigim shainim. In subsequent generations, the king and the Av Beisdin were two different people. Although, yes, it's true that the Nasi of the Sanhedrin would have the top position when it came to leadership in Taira, the Cholzois, still in all, Ein hu magia he still doesn't reach the level of the leadership that a king has. Shechein, because as we know, Gidre Shamelachu, that the category of a melech is defined by the fact, Ein Algabov Ella Hashem Elokov. There is no one above the king except for God, his God. And it's not only that there's no one above the king when it comes to sovereignty, for instance, in taking the Jews out to war or taking care of their other needs. But it's more than that. He is the singular sovereign. And he doesn't have to reckon with anyone else. Canal and to revert back to the verbiage that we were introduced to earlier in the Sicha, Dabar Echad the Dar Veloshne Debar. There's one spokesperson for the generation, not two. Lefisha Melach Enoi Ela Echad. There's only one king. The Ilu Nasia Sanhedrin. But when it comes to the head of the Sanhedrin, Kevan Shahu Echad Michavre based in Shel Ayin Aleph, because he is when all is said and done, one of 71. But because he is greater in Chachma than all of them, he emerges as their de facto head. But But his leadership is not in the same category as a king above whom there is no one but but the Melech Malchai Amloch, Ulefichach, and therefore Nasi Sanhedrin ain't a steer the Melech, and therefore it's not a contradiction to the king, and therefore it's not like two are jostling for one crown. Umemela, ain't the initial Shnei Melechim, Shnei Dabarim. So we're not talking about two kings. We're not talking about two spokespersons. We're talking about two positions, and there's a very clear hierarchy. But this model that would later be employed stands in stark contradistinction 
תמושן ישוע. הרי תכן הנשיא שלהם בתירה, because the content of their singular sovereignty that was in Tyra, Pailoi Rak Biyasim Nesia Sanhedrin, not only were they the heads of the Zakanim, Elagam Bikak Shamisha Kibel Tara Messina Yomasar Li Yeshua, Unesinus Kizu Bitaira, he bedagus Hanasiya Shel Mela. But Mesh and Yeshua are different because the sovereignty flows from Tara. It flows from the fact that Moshe Kibel Tara Misinai or Misar Yeshua. It's a different kind of sovereignty altogether. And because it is of one cloth and it cannot be separated into Ilu Hayadavar Mishalek. If it would be separated, as the Megala Amukais teaches, was Moshe's plan, she used Shnayim Ish Echad Ben Melchama Veshechad Betayra, Azai Hoyu Elu Beis Melacham Sheish Tamshu Bekesa Echad Shnei Debarim. In employing that model, yes, then you would have had the jostling of two heads for one crown. That would have been two spokespersons in one generation. But this was not who Moshe and Yeshua were. were. If you're thinking that you're not satisfied with this answer, either is the Rebbe. Seif Ches. Ach lich aira ein hadavar move on dait sarche. But it's still not understood enough. It's not properly computing. Seif Seif. Hare elu shnei sugim suge shrar shainim. The end of the day, there are two very different types of sovereignty. Why should there even be this problem of two kings and one crown? There's such different um, positions. There's such different modalities. Why the worry and why even describing it as two kings? Why is the one who's the general seemingly described as a king? And we might say that the explanation is as follows. It lies in understanding the unique position of kingship in Bnei Yisrael. When it comes to the position and the um, job description, perhaps, of a king, the Rambam writes as follows, a Jewish king. His stated goal and his preoccupation should be to raise the profile of the true religion and to fill the world to flood the world with justice, and to break the strong arm of the evildoers, and to wage God's wars, because really the whole reason that a Jewish king is appointed in the first place is to do mishpat, is to engage, in other words, in spiritual warfare. Yes, it's true that a Jewish king would also have to deal with um, more conventional warfare. But going back to the beginning, what should be his goal and what should be his preoccupation? Basically, to saturate the world entire with God consciousness. And so what's the beginning and what is the basis of this campaign that a Jewish king would wage? He became Vaharamas Hatera. 
Baharim Das Emes. The first thing that the Rambam lists is that the that the king must raise the profile, as it were, of of the true religion of Torah. Lahavi Lakiu Mishpatea Torah Bepayal. And to bring people practically to keeping the Torah. And in this way, the actual wars that a king has to wage, they too become suffused with God consciousness. And so we find, if we understand sovereignty, kingship, in this unique and particular way, then it emerges that the whole idea of sovereignty is an extension of, it's a continuum of the idea of the based in, of the Sanhedrin. Based in a gadol heim, amude ha-hoira, omehem choyko mishpat yaitzil chol Yisrael. They are the bastions, they are the pillars of instruction. And from them, uh, all matters of, of Torah law go out, they radiate to all of B'nai Yisrael. V'tafkido shal melech hu, shem mishpat atara yetzi me beisin ha gadol yiskayim b'poel ba'am Yisrael. And so what's the king's role? It's really as an extension of the based in to make sure that all of their teaching and all of their instruction actually filters down to, to the whole nation and, and is kept by them. Omitam zeh. And for this reason, in brackets, the Rebbe explains, Hadin hu, the halacha is, Shemitzvah ala melech l'chabed l'indeh ha-tayr. That a king has to show honor to the teachers of Torah and the learners of Torah. And when the Sanhedrin and the Chachme Yisrael come into the king, he should stand up for them. And for this, for the same reason, the king stands before the Kohen Gadol. If the king, for instance, comes to the Kohen Gadol to ask that something be transmitted through the agency of the Urim Vitumim, the king stands before the Kohen Gadol. Because the king is accepting instruction, uh, information, guidance from them. <coughs> and this is true. And at the same time, and at the same time, it's true that when it comes to, to the Melech sovereignty over the nation, Ein al Gabov Ela Hashem Elokav. There is no one above him, not the Av Beistin, not the Chachme Yisrael, not the Kohen Gadol. Ein al Gabov Ela Hashem Elokav. The Ein Lamayla Mimenu B'Machosay. And there is no higher tier in terms of sovereignty above him. The Al Kain, and therefore Bifar Hesia Bifnea Am. In public before the nation, the king should decidedly not stand before any person. So that the fear and awe of him should be deeply implanted in every heart. And for this reason, once we understand that there's no daylight, that there's no degree of separation, that there's absolutely no fissure, no frack. There's no differentiation, really, between Jewish sovereignty, kingship, and what the Basin is all about. You can't separate kingship and Nisius. Um, being the president or the head of the based in, in Torah, because they're not two different forms of leadership. You can't say that there's over that there's no overlap. On the contrary, they're part of one continuum. That is why when you divide them, yes, you're going to have a situation of two kings with one crown. See if Tess. 
Alpiza Yuvon, so this will understand. Well, now we're going to understand why the appointment of Yeshua was Davka through Moshe resting his hand on him rather than the anointing, which was, as you'll remember, the question that we asked at the very beginning. Because we understand that the Melech is in some way Mechabel, a recipient of the Beistin, or a continuum of the Beistin's mandate, and from the Beistin goes out Mishpat HaTayra, the adjudicating of all things Tayra. Hare Muvan ben Gael and Messias shall Yeshua. So it's understood that Apropos the appointment of Yeshua, Balderza ben Gail and Seir Shal Moshe, and similarly, the same thing, Moshe, it's not simply or only that Moshe Rabbeinu's appointment precedes the information about anointing with oil, but rather, Asherboi Hayushne in Yane Hanesius, Hain Melach, the Hainesius Hatayra Bidagas Melach. There was both. Aspects of sovereignty. In both Moshe and Yeshua, these aspects were one continuum. The fact that they were a king emerged out of the fact that they were the receptacles of Torah. Um, in the chat. As you explain this further, the word encapsulate comes to mind. It's a difference between wearing the crown and the clothing versus becoming the person who no longer has a separate will. Thank you, Hannah. Yeah, that's beautiful. Kleimar, this is to say, Iker in Yanayhu, Heyesai Nasi Betaira. This is to say, in full throated fashion, that the main aspect of the sovereignty is that they are sovereign in Torah. They are the ones that transmit, that sorry, that transfer the Torah in total to Bnei Yisrael. And as a continuum, and in addition, is like what the Rebbe describes here as being almost a pragmatic position, melucha, as a conduit for bringing all of this information to fruition in a practical way for the nation of Israel. And therefore, his appointment was through smicha, through Moshe putting his hand on him. The fact that for a king you need to anoint with the anointing oil, matarasa lif oil, es chalois inin hamalucha. What is the what is the efficacy? What is the um the point of the anointing with oil? It's to begin the sovereignty. It's to inaugurate. It's to establish something new. Al derech malchus shol rayas haramba, which was what happened with shol, which is the proof text that that the Rambam brings down. Masha enkin, but in contradistinction, malchus Yeshua, which the which the medrash compares to neitzer to ena. Yeshua's malchus is of a very different kind. Because Ikra, because the main foundation of his malchus, Nesias B'inin is the fact that he had received in total the transfer of the Torah from Meisha. Ulefichach, he nif'ala al smicha. And therefore, the formal start of his reign was effectuated through smicha, hakshur l'tayr dafka, which is connected 
to the transference of Torah authority. Shari dafka, because it's dafka specifically to Torah and to teaching that the Rambam and 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 the Gemara Sanhedrin say smuchin ish mipi ish, that one is ordained from the other, or the expression smuchun luna, ordain us. See if you. So based on the above explanation of the difference and the uniqueness of Moshe and Yeshua's leadership vis-a-vis -vis later generations, Muvan Gam, it's also understood, it's not a contradiction to call Shaul the first king and to also refer to Moshe and Yeshua as kings. Because the category of Malchus that Moshe and Yeshua had was a completely different type of Malchus. It's ain't a begetter. It's not in the same category. The fact that they were kings was secondary to their sovereignty in Tyre. And this can also explain why we don't find in the Tyre the halacha that a king has to be anointed with Shem and Hamishra. Seemingly, this is question, this is a question. Because the appointment of a king is a very clear mitzvah in the Torah, the Kama Pratim Banis Parshu Bataira Shibhtav, and there are a number of things about the king that are delineated in the Torah, not to have too many wives, not to have too many horses, and so on and so forth. We would think that the Torah would also tell us that the appointment of the king is done through the agency of Shemana Mishra. Like we find that the Torah does tell us that the Kayin Gadol had to be anointed, that the Kayin that went out before the Jews in war had to be anointed. Chani is asking why then were subsequent kings anointed. It seems that the Rebbe is saying that in subsequent generations, this was the um, way in which their position was jump-started, as it were. This was the formal beginning of their position as Malachim, as opposed to Yeshua, Moshe and Yeshua, for whom the melucha flowed as a natural extension from the fact that they were um, the receptacles of the Torah. Or are you asking something more and I'm not understanding? Something? No, no, it's a simple question. I'm just, uh, maybe I'm just missing something. Why, if we're saying that it's the first and that's why it's an anointing, if, why was every king subsequently anointed if the first happened already? Each ah, one had a first. This was the way in which their malchus begun. This was the way in which Hashem vested them with, with malchus. So each one had to go through that um, process or formality, but it's not it's not a formality. It's um, it's like the opening of a conduit of their malucha. And so based on the above, it's understood. The Indian of malucha, the way it was originally established in Torah, and as it was practically 
uh, personified in the person of Moshe and in his successor Yeshua, is in a way where the Melech is also the leader in Torah, and the Malchus flows naturally as an extension of his leadership in Torah. And therefore, you don't need the Shem and Amishra because that's not the start of their Malchus. And the fact that the appointment of a king would have to be through the agency of the anointing oil, specifically in that way, this his This was a novelty that came to be in a later generation. When it became, when it came time for Shaul to be the melech. Um, if I was more intelligent, I would stop here. But um, I can't control myself because I am thinking that the same question that I have must be in a lot of people's heads. So we're going to learn together Ha'aras 59 and 60, even though I have only questions and no answers. But um, there's something to seeing that, uh, that there's a question and that we're not the only ones that have the question. And the question is Tzarech Iyun. It needs further study. Um, I, I did call a number of people and um, try to pick their brains and learn from them. Um, and I'm exactly in the same position as where I started. Um, so Ara 59. The Tzarech Iyun B'negei L'Melech HaMashiach. Right? The whole Indian of Mashiach is Miloshan. Mashiach being anointed. But isn't Mashiach going to be the leader that not only encapsulates everything of Moshe and Aaron and David and Shlema and but like beyond? Shagam Etzli Yubeis and Yanim, Melech Virav. And we know that for sure Melech Mashiach will be both the Melech and the Rav. And if you look at the asterisk, um, the, I think it's but I, I'm, okay, I, I, I can't remember the Rashi David should have written it down. There is there is a shakal Bataria. Sorry. Could it be Minchas Chinuch? It could be. Probably is. Thank you. Um, I like the way she said it. it could it be. Yeah, thank you. Or a bezeh tefnas paneach laharayis v'shamu b'kama inyanim shebepnim. So there's this question. There's this outstanding question. And now let's go back into the p'nim of the ara. So there's, you should see that, ah, here's, here it is, Derech Mitzusecha and the Kote Sichas, and you have to look at the Lashon of the Rambam and Hilchas Tshuva, Im Tzarech Meshicha, Oy Smicha Kabi Yeshua. If Mashiach is going to need anointment or Smicha, V'Tzarech Iyun Shehashem Mashiach, Wa'idei HaMashicha, and we need further to study that the name of Mashiach emerges from the Edaman of Mashiach anointing, the loyal shame lemashcha ligdula, and not from the word to be pulled or um, drawn towards greatness. The ulai yebazesh neishlavim, and maybe there will be two phases. And and if you look at the two. Asterisks, the Rambam, Hilchas Melachim, Perak Yud Aleph, Halacha Dalit, Vim Yam Moid Melech Hule, or Elo Kotei Sichas. Shal Kain Tzarek Liyoy She Ain Kavanas Rambam She Bshas Hamida Tekev Yesh Loy Din Melech. 
it comes out that there will be two shlavim. There'll be Ya'amoid Melech, and then there'll be the din of the Melech in completion in total. So it looks like we're a very good company if we don't know exactly why Mashiach is called Mashiach after the term being anointed. If L'chair Mashiach is going to encapsulate all the forms and both modalities and more. And now I'm really showing my stupidity in wandering into Ha'ara 60, which I'm telling you right now, I don't understand the Kabbalah here. The Rebbe says, the Teichen Siv Zet, Zerich Iyun, has to be further studied. Shere Yedua Shem Malchus Uspiris HaMalchus Bishle Musan Hareze David, O Malchus Beis David, O Mashiach, O Behem Mukhreches Mashiachah. So if the whole idea of Malchus comes to a crescendo with the Malachim of Beis David and specifically through Mashiach, and they do need Mashiach, and Mashiach seems to be a lower level than Smiach, I don't know what, I should have written all this down. Okay, I don't understand um, the Kabbalah here that it's Malchus Vishli Musa, like it is Ba'aba Chachma Moshe, Da'aba Yisoid Barsa. And then the Rebbe says, after Yeshua Kapne Levana, which is Malchus, and even though Yeshua is said to have been like the moon, which is Makabel, and Malchus is the Indian of being Makabel, shiny Bishash is Samchumaisha, but this all changed at the moment that Moshe gave him Smicha. Shesmicha Hare Haya Bechol Kaychai. Rashi brings this down. The Gemara Chagiga says that Moshe gave him with all of his strength, with both hands. So the Imkain, so 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 how do we understand this? I I don't, that's for sure. Um very happy to hear if anybody can help us out here, or we have a we have a WhatsApp group for this purpose, so that if people discuss this with other people and can add and shed light on this, we I know we would all be very grateful. I have a few things to say. I want to ask you, um, 